welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Um, today's subject is basically going to be lenses. Now, I have a huge number of people asking me what lens should I buy? What size is my lens? What material choice have I got? Which is the best one? Which is the best value for money? To be honest, I can answer some of those questions, but not all of them. So today is a mixture of me giving you a little bit of information about what I already know and quite a lot of exploration into answering some of those questions that I don't know the answers to. Now, for example, a lens that might be suitable for engraving might not be the best lens for cutting. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the sort of question that I'm going to be hopefully trying to answer. So to start with, we're going to go through a bit of technical bump and try and explain what it is that we are working with here. The lens is the most important, apart from obviously the laser tube, the lens is the most important part of your machine. And before we start, I would recommend that everybody has a spare lens up their sleeve. It's the one thing that can easily fail on you. You can smoke it, you can damage it, you can burn stuff onto the surface, you can drop it, it will crack. Where are you going to get a new lens from? The answer generally is China, and that means it's three weeks away. Now, some of this stuff is a repetition of what I've already told you as I was going through my hunt for the smallest dot and compound lenses. But it's worth going through again because there's some new stuff that I, I wouldn't say I've discovered, but possibly I've come to understand better. Most of the lenses that you're going to have in your machine will be of this type. This is a plano convex lens. It's a flat on one side and curved on the other. Now, the problem with this particular type of lens is that the light rays passing through the middle get transmitted at a different angle to those that are coming down the outside. So those, if you've got a large beam, then the outside part of your lens produces something called spherical aberration. And spherical aberration is basically where the beam passes through the material and gets bounced off into space at a different angle that's not perfect to produce a single focal point. This point here looks as though it's quite sharp. But when you magnify it up, here's what's happening. The rays that are coming in from the outside are actually crossing over before the, focal, before the nominal focal point. And the rays that are coming down the centre are crossing over after the focal point. So there is a, a fuzziness associated with the focal point and it's difficult to say exactly where the best focal point is because com compounding this problem we've got this green curve here which is basically the energy density within the beam itself. So most of the energy is coming down the center of the beam and that energy which is at the outside of the beam which is a low energy it doesn't really matter that it crosses over before we get to the if you like, the nominal focal point. So this is a, an average of the energy that comes down, and it's the best average of all the rays that are passing through this fuzzy area. As you can see, they're crossing over at completely different places. But of course, they're not all uniform power, and that's the puzzle and the problem. One of the questions that comes up regularly, and I will may as well, while I've got this picture out, I will tackle this question. You've seen me setting up my z-axis and how meticulous I am about trying to get what we call the sweet spot on mirror three. The sweet spot is that point where the laser beam hits the mirror and passes vertically downwards to your table, absolutely per perpendicular to the table, but at the same time passes through the center axis of the lens. So what if it's a little bit off? I mean, you've seen me demonstrate this and I've corrected the problem that I had on my light blade machine. If we set the beam slightly off centre to the axis of the lens, what's going to happen is 
the high energy part of the beam is going to travel down here and look it's no longer vertical or perpendicular to the work surface which is across here and so you will get an off angle cut and that off angle cut is purely due to the fact that you haven't got your maximum energy density running through the axis of the lens. Now the problem is most of you guys do not have adjustment on your z-axis to achieve this and you have to go back and fiddle with the tube which is an absolute nightmare. And That's the reason why I keep pushing for the fact that we should have head adjustment on these machines so that we can set this particular axis up absolutely perfectly. This is only a problem if you're cutting thick materials as I'm just doing here. That's 10 millimeters thick on a 38 millimeter lens. So you haven't got to be very far off center to produce quite a significant angle. But of course if you're only engraving with this machine dots or for instance um, maybe you're only putting logos or half millimeter deep engraving into plywood then it doesn't matter if your beam is off center the only time it matters if your beam is off center is if you are doing cutting which to be fair most machines are doing there aren't many machines that only do engraving now <clears throat> when you bought this machine you didn't buy it as a laser cutting machine if you look these are always described as laser engraving machines and the one thing that a laser engraving machine comes with is an upside down lens the Chinese always fit these lenses this way round whereas in fact the ideal way to fit the lens is that way round so I've always advocated and I've always believed and people have told me so in general terms this is the correct way to set up the laser but of course as I was working with my dot mode looking for the best dots that I could possibly get I was purposely trying to distort the crossover point for these rays so that I could filter out the low energy rays and just work with the high density rays that come right down the center of the laser now if we take a look at the performance of a lens the wrong way round what we shall find is that the outside rays are crossing over here. Here's maybe the nominal focal point which I know six looks strange because it's not there but it all depends on the if you like the density the average density of the energy that we've got there we've got outside rays which are lower energy and the center rays which are high energy but of course they're still not really focused at this point here the only point that they really get focused is here this is where the really high energy beam is being focused and quite often you'll find that when you turn your lens over from say a 19 millimeter gap and you turn it over to this way you'll find that your gap between the nozzle and the what you consider to be the correct focal point changes by maybe as much as two millimeters so that 19 millimeter gap drops to 17 millimeters now this is where the 19 millimeters is it's at the focus point of the high energy beam that comes down the center the same sort of thing that I've been trying to achieve to get my small dots now I haven't tested this lens the wrong way round to see what size dots I get because I've used a compound lens to, uh, lens to exaggerate this effect even more but it could well be that because you are buying an engraving machine the lens is this way round for a very very good reason and that will enable you to get small dots from the lens the wrong way round what we're saying is to concentrate the energy for cutting you need it this way round but if you're doing photo engraving maybe and I've yet to prove this maybe this is the correct way round for photo engraving so that's lens type number one called a plano convex which is where we will not get a perfect focal point 
Now, there is another type of lens that we can buy, slightly more expensive, but not hideously so, that is something called a meniscus lens. And what happens here, we've got two curvatures on the lens. We've got the convex side first, and then we've got a concave side inside. So that what happens is that the beam comes through the lens and there is a correction that's specifically designed into the second part to try and make these come as close to a common focus point as possible. Now, it's never going to be absolutely perfect, but it's, if you get a good lens, it is pretty sharp at this point. The next question that I get asked, that I haven't got a cat in hell's chance of answering, is what size is my lens and what focal point, what focal length should I be using? How long is a piece of string? If your laser head is like this, then it's very likely that you will have your lens fitted into the nozzle, like this. And it sits down here, very close to the end of the nozzle. Now that means that probably anybody that's got a, a lens fitted in the nozzle will have an 18 millimeter diameter lens. Not a certainty, but a very high chance. So you need to remove your lens just by removing that screw and measure it before you order a new lens. Now, the other thing is, people that have got lenses mounted in the nozzle will be able to use a short focal length lens, 38.1, one and a half inch lens. There is another problem associated with having the lens mounted in here. This is fine for a one and a half inch lens, but if you want to start cutting with a two inch lens, for example, then this becomes a little bit of a hindrance to have your nozzle, to have your lens mounted there. Now, the alternative lens mounting system is this version here, which looks very similar, except the fact that this is the sort of thing that generally is on the red sail clone type machines and it is not interchangeable because it's a completely different diameter. The lenses in this system are likely to be 20 millimeters diameter and instead of being mounted in the nozzle they're mounted back in the stem here in this tube. Now I can see at a glance that this lens in here is a two and a half inch lens because it's mounted a long way back from the front here. If it was a two inch lens, it would be mounted much closer to the front of this face here. And then in addition to that, in the back of this tube, we've got another screw thread in here that allows me to put a lens in the back here, which is a four inch focal length lens. But sadly, if I try and put a 38 millimeter lens in here, first of all, we should need a gap between the nozzle and the work of probably anywhere between three to five millimeters. So if I put a three millimeter gap, three to five millimeter gap there, you'll see that the lens is going to be mounted here. And I can't get a lens mounted in there. The shortest lens that you could normally fit in here would be two inches. However, always the Rebel, I decided that I can fit a one and a half inch lens in here by machining out this piece here, putting the lens in here and putting a small retaining cap on top so that when I tighten it up, my lens sits in here and I can use this with a, a one and a half inch lens. Whoopee! So that was my first attempt at putting a one and a half inch lens in here. Now if we look carefully in here and I move them around in the light, you'll probably see that the shoulder in this one is much closer to the front here than the shoulder in this one. This is a two and a half inch by four inch lens holder and this one's a two inch by four inch lens holder. So if I take a one and a half inch lens and put it into that two inch lens holder and then use one of these special nozzles. Now I've got a soft plastic tie wrap here, I'll just clip the end off and we'll very carefully 
poke that up inside to touch the lens very carefully I don't want to damage the lens so there we go it's touching the lens there and we'll crudely measure that and that's 35 millimeters I've got about a three millimeter gap beneath my nozzle when I use this maybe you don't have a two inch maybe you have a two and a half inch lens and if you've got a two and a half inch lens then the focal point will disappear back up inside so what you can do then is something a slightly different trick so if you set that ring in there the clamp ring without a lens in it and set it to about six millimeters back from the front and then put an o-ring on top of the clamp ring This is a standard nozzle and I've modified that with an 18 millimeter diameter ring in the end there. So if you've got 18 millimeter diameter lenses and you don't want to buy more lenses, then you can drop an 18 millimeter one and a half inch lens in the end there like that. And then when you screw this on top, you can feel the O-ring just beginning to bite and hold everything nice and snug okay so now you've got yourself a one and a half inch lens with a standard nozzle on it or you can go out and spend money on the short nozzle if you've got a one and a half inch tube so there's all sorts of combinations that we've got now that talks about basically the different styles of mounting 20 millimeter lenses and 18 millimeter diameter lenses now most of the work that I'm going to be today, doing today will be using the 38.1 or one and a half inch lens. The only reason I'm doing that is because I want to compare like with like across the board and I have the majority of my lenses are 38.1. Okay let's go for the next confusing problem that people ask me about. So we go to a reputable website to buy lenses and we got this profusion of different choices that we can look at. Here we've got a CVD, zinc selenide lens. It's a meniscus lens. Well, we've already described the difference between meniscus and plano convex. If the word meniscus is not in the description, you have to assume that you're going to get a plano convex lens. So here we've got a CVD lens and it's gonna cost me for a 20 millimeter lens with a 38.1, it's gonna cost me $24. It's quite an expensive lens because this material is actually made in the USA. This CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition and it's the method by which the zinc selenide is made. Zinc selenide is a naturally occurring material but not in the quantities or the quality required to produce our lenses so it has to be man-made and it's man-made either by this process called chemical vapor deposition or there is another process called physical vapor deposition and look the price difference is huge $15 as opposed to 24 but that's because these lenses are I wouldn't call them lower quality but they've got different properties these lenses here will easily work up to probably two or three hundred watts whereas these are probably only going to work up to maybe hundred just over a hundred watts you might get away with 120 130 watts okay so you can pay your money and you can take your pick now what is the performance of these lenses compared to each other we've got a CDV meniscus and we've got a PVD meniscus. Are they going to perform any differently? Is the light transmission through them better, one or the other? Are they capable of producing better quality dots? Those are the sorts of questions hopefully I'm going to be able to answer later on. Okay, so we've got yet another choice here. Look, we've got this company here, 2.6. They're an industrial quality company. They are really top grade. 
and they are producing lenses which will cost you $35. But hang about, these are Plano convex lenses because it doesn't say meniscus. But you know, is paying a lot of money a cost benefit? Is it guaranteeing you get a better quality lens? Is it any better at transmitting the power? Is it any better at making dots? Those are the sort of questions we're going to answer later on. Wow, look at this. From that same industrial company, we're going to be asked to pay $750 for a lens. If we look carefully, we'll see this is for a Trump or Bistronic cutting machine. Now these are both industrial quality, high power machines, three, four, five kilowatt machines. So this is nothing to do with us. This is just this particular company here selling to good quality industrial machines as well as the lower quality hobby market. Okay, but again you'll see that it's still a ZN SE. So zinc selenide is capable of going up to kilowatts if it's the right quality material. Now we've got a further confusion. Gallium arsenide, GAAS, $24. What's the advantage of gallium arsenide? It is a more durable material, although the coating, it's an interesting point, whether it's the coating that's more durable. The material itself is definitely durable, but the coating is probably just as vulnerable on here as it is on all of these other systems. Now, we haven't talked about coatings yet, but I'll come back to that in a minute. We're just talking about the profusion of choices that you've got when you go looking for a lens. So gallium arsenide is a possibility, but if you have a beam combiner with a visible red beam, this will not work for you. The beam will go as far as this lens and then will not be transmitted through it. Because this does not transmit visible light, it only transmits infrared light. And finally you're likely to find something like this, which is a germanium lens. Now, it's $14, and to be honest, if you look at it, it's only 12 millimeters diameter. We don't have much choice. And the reason for that is because these germanium lenses, first of all, they're not designed to run with anything powerful. They're probably suitable for the 40 watt K40 machines, where you may have a 12 millimeter diameter lens to deal with a very small beam diameter. Most of you guys will not be wanting to look at germanium and it's a strange material anyway which we'll come on to in a second. So we've got this whole profusion of choice of materials. You can go and do some research on the 26 website. They've got a lot of information there about the materials themselves. Or you can go to this website, Crystal Techno. Again, they've got a lot of technical information about the products and these materials. Now I'm going to touch on the materials themselves now because in life, we've got three basic classes of material when it comes to working with our infrared 10.6 micron wavelength light. We've got those materials that will reflect the light. And very generally, that's all metals. All metals will reflect infrared light to some greater or lesser degree. Aluminium, gold, silver, copper, rhodium, those sorts of metals are capable of reflecting up to 99% or more of the infrared light that is fired at them. And that's all due to the crystal structure of the materials themselves in their solid state. And those are the sorts of materials that we use for mirrors. Now, there's another huge class of materials called non-metals. And non-metals obviously include your skin and any plastics and all sorts of other materials that you can imagine. If it's not metal, it's a non-metal. And virtually every non-metal is capable of being excited. Its molecules are capable of being excited by infrared light. And it's the excitement by the infrared light that causes the material to heat up and do something. That's how we manage to damage the material. 
So that's the second class of materials that we're going to come across. There is a third class of materials which is very narrow and those are the materials that we can use for lenses. They are either transparent or semi-transparent to infrared light. Now for a lens obviously we need the light, the infrared light to pass through it. Life is not quite that simple. So let's take a look at zinc selenide to start with. The best quality zinc selenide at 10.6 microns, which is here, is only about 70% efficient at transmitting the light that we fire at it. The other 30% is reflected. It isn't absorbed to heat the material up, it's actually reflected. Now, in some ways, that's good news that it's not absorbed to heat the material up. Because what they can do with special coatings, special thicknesses and special processes, they can add a coating, an anti-reflective coating, to the material. So when you look at your zinc selenide lens and you'll see that it's got a slightly strange greeny hue, that's the coating that's on the material. And it's an anti-reflective coating that actually promotes that 70% transmission up to 98, 99% efficiency. So you can expect a zinc selenide lens, a good quality zinc selenide lens with the right sort of coating on it, to be up in the 99% efficient transmission range. Gallium arsenide. Well, here's a gallium arsenide lens. Again, it's coated and it jolly well needs to be coated because look, at 10.6 microns wavelength here, it's only about 60% efficient at transmitting infrared light. It's 0% efficient at transmitting visible light. But why would you use that as a lens? Well, the reason again is it has been coated with a special anti-reflective coating which allows it to come up here to probably 98, maybe more percent efficient. This is one of the things that we're going to check. I've not been able to find any data about the coating process and what efficiency we're going to finish up after gallium arsenide has been coated. And then finally, the other product that we saw, which was germanium. Oh dear, look at this, 10.6. We're just on the cusp of falling off here to 40%, but we're around about 45, 46% efficient at 10.6 microns wavelength. Again, they coat this material to make it more efficient. How much more efficient? I don't know. We won't be able to test that because I haven't got a germanium lens. It's not something that I really want because it has got a strange and peculiar property. If you start using this in a laser machine which is much over 40 watts, if you, if you break down this coating that's on here and the infrared light starts getting through to the material underneath, then it will start heating the material up. And although it's transparent at room temperature, once it gets up to about 100 degrees C, this material all of a sudden becomes cloudy and opaque to infrared light. And as soon as it becomes opaque to infrared light, it means it starts absorbing it. And you get thermal runaway and you will pop the lens. It's fairly safe to use if you've got a K40 machine, but don't even consider a, a germanium lens for any other type of machine. 60 watts and above, stay with gallium arsenide or zinc selenide. That's given you a pretty brief summary of the materials and roughly what I know about the materials so far. Now I'm not going to subject you to the trauma of watching hours and hours of me experimenting. I'm going to probably spend a day or two days playing with this machine and these various lenses and at the end of it we'll take a look at the most interesting parts and the discoveries that I've made along my journey. Okay now having just beaten you up about the z-axis and making sure that the beam runs through the axis of the lens the first thing I'm able to do with this particular head 
is to drop a little target in there and do a pulse test. And there we go. I think we can see clearly that my beam is lined up. So I can do that check very simply at any point in time. The first lens we're going to try is a meniscus lens of Chinese origin. And this is basically the PVD lens. Okay, now for testing purposes, I'm going to use my one millimeter thick beer mat card because this is basically wood pulp. There's no china clay in this, this is just soft and it's going to exaggerate or show me the halo around the outside of the laser beam, basically the spherical aberration element of the beam. So I shall get a nice sharp dot in the middle but probably a brown halo around the edge. Okay, now as you can see this card is not exactly completely flat and we need it pretty flat to set up the focus because we're trying to find exactly the right spot to focus our lens onto. So I'm going to hold that down with a piece of with a couple of little magnets and we're going to start off with a gap of about five millimeters which I know is probably the wrong dimension. So there we go, that's a nice five millimeter gap. Origin, test. Okay, let's bring it down the page a little bit. Origin, and we'll take the gap down to four millimeters. Bring it down a bit, press the origin button, and we'll set it down to three millimeters. And then we'll come forward a little bit and we'll go down to two millimetres. Okay, so now what we've got to do is to find out which one of those is the crispest image. My 432. I'm now going to inspect this with my eyeglass because it's the only way that you can possibly do it. And I would actually say that we've got the best results at two millimetres. Now bear in mind this is a meniscus lens where the focus is supposed to be crisp. We're not expecting to see too much by way of a halo around there. Okay, well while we're doing this test, let's swap lenses and change to the USA CDV lens. Now I think if you put these two lenses side by side you can immediately see the difference. This one is much more of a toffee colour and this one is a lovely yellowy golden colour. So that's one of the ways that you can tell the difference between a PDV and a CDV. They tend to be this slightly darker brown, the PDV. So most Chinese lenses will be this colour and if they get any browner than this they're probably lower quality. So you can get some really dark brown lenses which to be honest, I wouldn't want to put more than about 40 watts through them. Okay, so now we're going to try the 2.6 high quality lens. Now this is, unfortunately, a Plano convex. That's all I was able to get hold of. So this is a Plano convex gallium arsenide that will compare with the previous two lenses. And now we'll finally do the same trick with the gallium arsenide. We'll turn that upside down as well and see what that looks like upside down. There's our first array of tests done. And what we now ought to do is go and document those and I'll show you one or two of the results. We'll go and look at them under the microscope. Now I've broken them up into two groups because these, were, these here were done with the long nozzle and these here were done with the short nozzle. These were 18 millimeter diameter lenses and all these were 20 millimeter diameter lenses. While I've got this sheet out like this and you can see it very easily, I've got the Chinese meniscus lens and the USA meniscus lens and I've tested them both the correct way and the upside down way. I've done the same thing for a Chinese Plano convex lens, the expensive 2.6 
Plano convex lens. I've then swapped the expensive Plano convex lens to the incorrect way, i.e. Uh, the convex side downwards. And then I've done the same thing with the Chinese lens. So I've got both lenses the right way and the wrong way, Plano convex. And then finally, we've done the Plano convex gallium arsenide. And again, just to make things complete, I've turned that upside down as well to see what the performance is backwards. Although I've been trying to find the focus point of each one of these, what it's really doing is telling me the best possible dot size that I can get from each one of these lenses. OK, well, here are the results. I'm not going to actually talk you through them. What I'm going to do is to put the compound lens, which I developed in a previous session, and these are results from the compound lens. I'm going to ghost this data into the background. It's at the same scale as all the other results so that you can do a comparison of line thickness, dot size, and the amount of aberration, shadowing, haloing that occurs around each one of the images. Now here you can see just a very small amount of halo around the lines at the top and around the dots in the middle. And there is just a small amount along those at the bottom, but it's almost negligible. You won't find that as you go through. So just remember, these are pretty clean results. Now I'm going to jump in at this point because this CDV meniscus lens caught my eye and I've pushed its performance a little bit further to see just how good I can get it. Now if we take a look at this when I push the speed up to 150 millimeters a second you can hardly tell the difference between this and my compound lens and that makes me ask the question why on earth would I go out and buy a compound set of lenses? when I can do it with a single lens. Very interesting result. The other standout performer for me, surprisingly enough, was the PDV meniscus lens from China. Now, used its conventional way up with the convex side up and the flat side down, it's pretty ordinary. The dots are big and the halo is very obvious and the lines are thick. So this is a pretty ordinary lens for dot work. But when we turn it over, two things stand out. First of all, yeah, we've still got a bit of a halo there, but the dot size has come right down and the focal length has changed dramatically by four millimeters, which tells me that the theory that we put forward before about turning the lens upside down is probably correct. So for dot work you could use this cheap PDV lens and you'd get some pretty good results. Who said comparing lenses would be easy? I thought this was going to be maybe a three-quarter hour video but hey we've already used up that time and we've only looked at one aspect of these lenses and that's its ability to produce small dots. That's fine if you are very much into photo engraving but most of you are not and so we've still got to measure power and we should do that with 
one of these many power instruments that I have here. We've still got to look at the price relative to overall performance. And we've got to see how well these various lenses actually perform real cutting. Because as I said to you before, when you look at the advertising, these are sold as engraving machines. They're not sold as cutting machines, cutting as an incidental. And the surprising thing that we found out about the cheap Chinese lens was it worked extremely well upside down the way that it is supplied. So, you know, as I said, I've always subscribed to the myth and believed it myself that, yeah, the Chinese don't know what they're doing putting these lenses in upside down. Well, maybe we ought to give them a little bit more credit and accept the fact that, yeah, these lenses are put upside down because they work well as engraving machines. Now, we've yet to find out whether we've got any more surprises when we look at cutting. So I can absolutely say that we're going to run out of time today and I've got this feeling that this session on lenses is actually going to be three parts. I think the next session will be looking at power that's being transmitted by the lenses. It's a long process but it might not take too long in video terms to do the comparison. So we might be able to get onto cutting and it might be a two-part video. So I'm going to conclude this session here and say thank you very much for your time and we'll push on with our discoveries and investigations next time. Until then, bye.